Hello everyone. Welcome to the Health for the World Grand Rounds. So we'll be waiting for a minute for everybody to join the Grand Rounds and then I will hand it over to Dr. Whitehead. All right, so I guess we are good to start now. So I welcome Dr. Matthew Whitehead for today's grand rounds on sorting out posterior fossa fluid collections. Dr. Whitehead is a pediatric neuroradiologist and associate professor of radiology in Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. After completing his radiology residency at the University of Virginia, he pursued a neuroradiology fellowship at the UCSD and a pediatric neuroradiology fellowship at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Health for the World teams welcomes you, Dr. Whitehead. Now I hand it over to you for the lecture. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'll be talking about sorting out posterior fossa fluid collections. I have nothing to disclose. So we're going to review normal embryologic development of the rhombencephalon, meninges, and meningeal fluid spaces to help improve our understanding of posterior fossa fluid collections. I'm going to demonstrate some common pathology using fetal and postnatal natal MRI primarily, but some ultrasound, and hope to show a pattern approach for diagnosis of posterior fossa fluid collections. So posterior fossa fluid collections are challenging, especially in the developing neonate where, you know, the etiologies run the gamut of normal to abnormal with enlargement of the cystic uh, spaces, ventricles, or meningeal fluid spaces. But the imaging patterns can be characteristic. But remember that Dandy Walker malformation, vermine hypoplasia, Blake's pouch cyst and vermian hypoplasia with Blake's pouch cyst can overlap in their imaging appearance on fetal MRI, but the distinction is important um, for counseling, for therapeutic planning, and to stratify patients for genetic um, you know, evaluation. And you can see here, the literature shows that the yield for Blake pouch cyst is about 1%, Dandy Walker 16%, and vermian hypoplasia up to 50%. So let's talk about some anatomy and embryology. To set the stage, let's look at the normal appearance of a relatively mature posterior fossa postnatally. The midbrain to pons to medulla ratio is at least one to 1.5 to one. The back of the brainstem in front of the vermis are roughly parallel. This, the tegmental vermian angle is similar to the brainstem to vermis angle on ultrasound, which is should be less than 18 degrees, but on MRI, uh, those measurements are more strict. So under the age of 24 weeks, um, we give less than 12 degrees and over the age of 24 weeks gestation, less than eight degrees. The vestigial recess of the fourth ventricle is sharp, located just below the midpoint of the pons. It's shaped by the nodulus. If you draw a line from the vestigium through the primary fissure, that separates the vermis into roughly a two to one ratio above and be sorry below and above this line, but that ratio is not typically achieved until about 18 to 19 weeks gestation. There are nine vermian lobes, although visibility is gestational age dependent. The height of the vermis extends from about the mid tectal plate to the level of the obex, and you can see that cisterna cisterna magna is relatively small here, and it's approximating the undersurface of the vermis. Uh, and the, the, the lower um, occipital bone uh, is close to the vermis, unlike in uh, the fetal MRI when this space is quite capacious, but always less than 10 millimeters. And this is to accommodate the massive growth of the cerebellum, the largest and fastest growing structure uh, in the uh, brain in the second and third trimesters. And this is why fetal biometry is very important on fetal MRI. Sorry, this is my relatively simplistic depiction of antenatal uh, timeline uh, broken into trimesters. Uh, and you can see that just after neural tube closure at about five weeks gestation, the cerebellum is born. Simultaneously, the meninx is transforming into the meninges and the cisterna magna. And there's an interplay between the meninx, the meninges, and the cerebellum such that damage or malformation can impair cerebellar growth. 
Then there's a period of intense neuronal migration from about nine to 13 weeks. And by the end of the first trimester, the cerebellum is extraventricular and the torcular is in its normal position. That means anything with significant mass effect in the posterior fossa um, can cause torcular elevation or failed descent. So it's not specific to, nor is it necessary for the diagnosis of Dandy Walker malformation. You can see that in arachnoid cyst, Blake pouch cyst, or even megacisterna magna. Then the frame of Majet, Majin, uh, the frame of Majindi will perforate at a variable time frame, somewhere between four weeks and four months, but typically around nine to ten weeks gestation. Uh, and finally, at about 15 weeks, the cerebellum is formed for all intents and purposes, and the frame of Lushka perforates later, um, somewhere after, say, 16 weeks gestation. Let's look at some of the events that are occurring in the end of the first trimester and beginning of the second trimester in a more diagrammatic form. So at this point in time, the mesenchyma that will form the quarry plexus has insinuated itself into the back of the brainstem, separating the anterior from the posterior membranous area. As the cerebellar vermis grows down from the ismic region, the anterior membranous area um, is obliterated and incorporated into the vermis. If there is arrested development of growth of the vermis or there's a problem with the hind plate, either disruptive or genetic, you get the Dandy Walker malformation where there is a persistent anterior membranous area. The vermis is underdeveloped, especially inferiorly. It's under rotated. The vestigial recess is flattened and the quarry plexus is nowhere to be seen being displaced down and out. Later, um, you get um, evagination of the, of the posterior membranous area to form the Blake's pouch. Uh, if all goes well, this perforates and forms the foramen of Majindi. Uh, if this process is delayed or does not occur, you can get a Blake's pouch cyst where the tegmentovermian angle is elevated. Um, and we can see that um, the quarry plexus is here stretched along the undersurface of the cerebellum. These high resolution sonographic images um, from the end of first beginning of second trimester show this process where the vermis is growing down and obliterating the anterior membranous area during this time frame. Note the quarry plexus is normally visible here along the central undersurface of the cerebellum. Um, and also note how if you include this in your measurement, you will overestimate the cerebellar height. So by 18 weeks on fetal MRI, um, we should see uh, a defined vestigial point, the sharp vestigial point here, a primary fissure. We want to see the tegmentovermian angle at less than 12 degrees and a covered fourth ventricular roof. Of course, this all depends on good resolution, motion-free images, uh, and a nice midline sagittal to be able to evaluate that. In the axial and coronal plane, I like to look for what I call the speed bump and uh, bow tie knot of the vermis. And you can see uh, that's a nice reassuring sign that the cerebellum is forming normally. All right, so, uh, and then as we move forward here at 18 weeks, again, in the coronal plane, in the axial plane, I'm looking for this sort of bow tie knot and speed bump appearance of the vermis. And in the sagittal plane, you know, early, it's really hard to see all the, all the, not, all the lobes. So you often will see these three areas of low signal corresponding to the anterior vermis, the posterior vermis, and the neovermis. And then, of course, over time, there's growth and development of the cerebellum. All right, let's talk about the normal anatomic relationships between the choroid and telechoroidea. So the tania are little white matter protuberances that delimit the lateral margin of the rhomboid fossa. From the tania arise the telechoroidea. So telechoroidea is a vascularized membrane of epinema and arachnoid, and this houses the quarry plexus. Uh, this runs in the inferior medullary vellum from the flocculus to the nodulus. And these three um, things form a structural chain such that location of one should tell you the location of others. Um, so, uh, and, and the back of the brainstem and the telechoroidea have a relatively obtuse um, angle, and the leaves of the telechoroidea, the uh, angle is relatively obtuse. Now, this, this angle will get smaller in Blake's pouch cyst and in Dandy Walker malformation, so we'll come back to that concept later. But can you see these by imaging? The answer is yes, you can. 
Uh, if you have um, relatively motion-free images, reasonable slice thickness, and a keen eye, uh, and it's not gestational age dependent. So here you can see this sort of V-shaped appearance in the axial plane of the telochroidea coming off the back of the medulla and heading upwards uh, and centrally towards the lower vermis. It's always seen postnatally as well here, pre and post contrast parasagittal T1 weighted images, you can see enhancing membrane coming off the back of the brainstem, heading upwards towards the margin of the vermis. And then here at midline, the cori plexus descending posteriorly along the nodulus to the back margin of the foramen omegindi, um, normal appearance of the cori plexus and telochoroidea. In the coronal plane, the cori plexus assumes a T shape with paired lateral and medial limbs. And here the steady state image nicely shows the telochoroidea and at the edge, the cori plexus. The Falk cerebelli is another important structure to evaluate uh, when we're looking at the posterior fossa because it can offer clues to posterior fossa pathology. And remember, I said, you know, malformations or, um, you know, destruction of the, um, the, the dura and of the posterior fossa can lead to a cerebellar uh, maldevelopment. Um, so, Normally, we see the Falk cerebelli in up to 98% of, of fetal, fetal MR studies. Um, it's usually retrovermian centered. Unusually, is it linear? More likely, is it Y shaped, U shaped, or V shaped? Uh, and here is kind of the common appearance in various pathologies. In Chiari 2, it's um, usually absent, as is Dandy Walker malformation and Robin cephalosynapsis. It's often multiplied in megacisterna magna, and if you're lucky, it may be deviated in arachnoid cysts to help you make that diagnosis. All right, on to some pathology. So um, basically, the differential diagnosis of posterior fossa fluid collections is going to be cysts, CSF space enlargement, and hindbrain malformations. Um, so we'll go through some of these. I will omit epidermoid and enteric cysts just briefly. You know, if you if you see a, a, a cyst, it's nice to do diffusion um, to look for restricted diffusion, which might point towards epidermoid cyst. And then an enteric cyst, uh, typical appearance is going to be a um, cystic lesion in front of the lower brainstem that may be bright on T1 weighted images uh, and may or may not be associated with a segmentation anomaly. Okay, so first, arachnoid cyst duplication or fibrous arachnoid cysts. Um, so these um, have a typical appearance where uh, there's enlargement of the cisterna magna and e evidence of more focal mass effects. So there's something inside the cisterna magna enlarging it and um, pushing structures around. And so you can see in this coronal and axial ultrasound, um, there is a cystic fluid space here displacing the cerebellum, displacing the falx cerebri towards the left. Uh, this is an arachnoid cyst. Um, in the fetal MRI, same patient, the cerebellum is otherwise structurally normal, but again, displaced anteriorly, this enlarged cisterna magna, um, and the Falk cerebri, or Falk cerebelli on the MRI is not really visible. Again, we could see distortion and mass effect along the back of the cerebellum. And if you look closely, a little septation here, which may represent the wall of the cyst. Now, this case is sort of a cautionary tale um, because, um, you know, this the mother was counseled to kind of return uh, for postnatal evaluation and postnatal ultrasound. She did not. The patient did return at 14 months uh, with hypertonia. Brace yourself for the next images uh, where we have massive hydrocephalus that has developed due to enlargement of the arachnoid cyst here. This, this cyst was fenestrated and the patient did well postoperatively. Here's another case of an arachnoid duplication cyst. In this case, the cerebellum is normal, right? Normal height, normal AP dimension. The primary fissure is present. Vestigial recess is sharp. Tegmental angle, tegmental vermian angle is normal, but we see enlargement of the cisterna magna and we see uplifting of the torcular and displacement of the falx cerebri. This implies that this lesion probably developed um, before implantation of the torcular at the end of the first trimester. Classic arachnoid duplication cysts, you know, these usually um, stay stable over time, but obviously can enlarge um, given, uh, as I showed on the pre previous case, or they can get smaller. So they should be followed um, just to be sure. Here's a 27-week gestation. Here we see a cyst in front of the brainstem 
displacing it posteriorly and compressing it. Um, this is a classic membrane of Lilliquist arachnoid cysts. Uh, postnatally, it looks identical displacement and posteriorly of the um, brainstem. The aqueduct is narrowed, although there's no significant ventriculomegaly. megaly. And there's no restricted diffusion, so this is not an epidermoid cyst. So these often do very well, and this patient was followed out to at least to two years of age um, and was asymptomatic. Then you can have um, cystic changes or cystic development um, called fibrous arachnoid cysts from prior inflammation or hemorrhage. And here's a case of a post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus where the patient had a germinal matrix hemorrhage here on the T1-weighted image extending through the ventricles out into the CSF spaces um, and causing this enlargement of the cisterna magna, a fibrous arachnoid cyst secondary to hemorrhage. Here's another case of a post-hemorrhagic um, fibrous arachnoid cyst here underneath the cerebellar vermis, uh, causing mass effect on it, widening um, the foramen of Magendi, displacing the tela choroidea as well and causing obstructive hydrocephalus. Next uh, is Blake's pouch cyst or diverticulum. So what makes this a Blake's pouch cyst and really nothing else for that matter? Uh, one is the cerebellum is normal. So again, it's normal height, normal HP dimension. The vestigial recess is present, although a little bit blunted, probably due to mass effect. The tegmental vermian angle is elevated and the quarry plexus is present along the vermian undersurface uh, here in sort of displaced outward due to mass effect. And remember, this is sort of a surrogate for the posterior membranous area, if you remember back to the embryology, and this belongs along the undersurface of the vermis rather than displaced in a dandy walker malformation. And if you look closely here, you may be able to see the cyst walls of the Blake's pouch cyst. All right, so this is thought to be due to failed opening of the foramen of Magindi or late opening of foramen of Lushka. Uh, and these will, a lot of these will resolve by 25 weeks gestation. Um, and so, you know, you can follow these up and, and, and look for that. Here's another case of a Blake's pouch cyst. Cerebellum is normal, tegmental vermian angle a little elevated, and we see the telocroidea choroid plexus extending upwards and inwards toward the surface of the vermis rather than down and out in a dandy walker malformation. Same patient postnatally, again, choroid plexus here underneath the vermis, vermis otherwise normal in appearance. This is a Blake's pouch cyst. Another case of a Blake's pouch cyst, um, cerebellar vermis, normal, other than being, again, a little tilted and enlargement of the tegmental vermian angle. Here's the telocroidea, again, extending centrally and upward towards the undersurface of the vermis. You can see that also in the axial plane. If you follow up, here we come, we're at the medulla level, we're coming up to the pons, and we can see the telocroidea and choroid plexus ascending um, towards the cerebellar undersurface and in the coronal plane as well. So this again is a Blake's pouch cyst. Um, and you can also, if you have gradient echo images, um, because the choroid plexus is vascularized, it will be dark here and you can use that to help you find it. Same patient postnatally at seven weeks, normal tegmental vermian angle is now normal and not you know, elevated and normal position of the telocoroidea. Here's another case, uh, again, um, mild ele elevation of the tegmental vermian angle, telocroidea going towards the vermis, postnatally, choroid plexus underneath the vermis. Um, but if you look at these single shot images, you can see CSF flow moving from the fourth ventricle into the cisterna magna around the lower brainstem and upper cervical spinal cord. So there is no true cyst here at this point. This is probably perforation of a prior Blake's pouch cyst. So this is a Blake's pouch diverticulum. And finally, one last case of a Blake's pouch cyst. Again, choroid plexus here is ectopic underneath the vermis, large cisterna magna. But in this case, we have concurrent hypoplasia of the cerebellar vermis. So just to show you that you know these things don't have to occur in isolation, you can have more than one path pathologic process. All right, so uh, on to CSF space enlargement. So we have the enlarged, quote, mega cisterna magna. Um, in this case, what you wanna see is the cerebellar vermis is normal. There's no hydrocephalus. Um, you have enlargement of the cisterna magna without focal mass effect. 
Um, and often the fault cerebri will be abnormal. Here it's elongated and the cisterna magna is large, right, greater than 10 millimeters in depth. Here's a different case where we can see that the cisterna magna is large uh, and actually this cerebellar, the, the torcular is elevated. In this particular case, the fault cerebri uh, is elongated. Um, and remember, you know, in any case of a posterior fossa anomaly, you don't wanna just evaluate the posterior fossa, we want to look at the rest of the brain as well, and also the body. Um, and even in mes mega cisterna magna, if you find other anomalies, there's a 21%, uh, uh, and you can find them in 21%. And if you do, a third of these have aneuploidy. So it's certainly important to look at the rest of the brain and body, uh, because if it's isolated, it is a good prognosis. And then, um, you know, again, the false cerebri can be multiplied, and that's very common in megacisterna magna. External hydrocephalus, here's a 31-week uh, fetus, sagittal and axial plane T2-weighted images. You can see the cisterna magna is enlarged. The cerebellar vermis is otherwise normal. There is no hydrocephalus, but the false cerebri is multiplied here. So it turns out that this patient has a sibling with a large head, the dad has a large head and an uncle has a large head. So this is consistent with enlarged subarachnoid spaces and benign familial macrocephaly. And you can see the subarachnoid spaces along the vertex of the brain are expanded. And then you can have post-hemorrhagic dilation or again, fibrous arachnoid cyst that occurs uh, in the posterior fossa here in this coronal gradient echo sequence, we can see susceptibility in the left cotothalamic groove indicative of a germinal matrix hemorrhage that extended into the ventricles, probably into the subarachnoid spaces and caused uh, expansion of the cisterna magna. Then obviously reduced Raman cephalic vol uh, volume could then make the CSF spaces enlarged ex vacuo. And here we see a cerebellar insult with CSF ex vacuo enlargement. Note in this coronal plane, there's a deficiency of the left versus the right cerebellar hemisphere and here in the axial plane. So this is a prior, you know, whether it's hemorrhage or, you know, ischemic event um, that resulted in um, ex vacuo enlargement of the CSF spaces. Um, another case uh, here in the sagittal and axial plane on this T2 weighted uh, sequences fetal MRI, we see this very unusual hypoplastic appearance of the cerebellum, the transverse cerebellar diameter is small, Fermian height is small, CSF spaces here are enlarged, and there's this vaulted appearance at the back of the brainstem here. Postnatally, it becomes more um, visible and consistent with pontine tegmental cap dysplasia. Okay, so that onto other sort of hindbrain malformations. First is the Dandy Walker malformation. Uh, here's a 23-week gestation in sagittal, axial, and coronal planes, uh, and we can see the typical look of a Dandy Walker malformation where there is hypoplasia of the vermis, especially the inferior part of the vermis. The tegmental vermian angle is increased, right? And uh, there's this tail of tissue extending from the lower margin of the vermis, and in this case, the torcular is elevated. So this is a classic Dandy Walker malformation. But what you might not have noticed is uh, this sort of curvilinear area uh, signal, this tissue extending from the lower margin of the, of the brainstem down and out. This is the telocroidea and chori plexus displaced inferiorly and laterally, um, supporting uh, the diagnosis of a Dandy Walker malformation. This you know, may be trivial in this particular case, but it's vital in other cases where we don't have the typical classic appearance of Dandy Walker malformation here. Again, we can see the telocroidea um, displaced distant from the vermis um, as, as you see with Dandy Walker malformation. So here's, so what are these, one of these trickier cases on fetal MRI at 36 weeks, we can see that yes, the tegmental vermian angle is a little bit elevated. When you do the biometry here and measure the vermis, you know, you get sort of borderline measurements, low normal to mildly decreased. The cisterna magna is enlarged. So what do you do with that? That's when you want to go and look for the telocroidea because if it's down and out, then that's Dandy Walker malformation. If it's up and in towards the vermis, we may be dealing with a Blake's pouch cyst and potentially inferior vermian hypoplasia. Here, same patient, 23 days old. We can see again the telocroidea is displaced. 
um, inferiorly and laterally here in the axial plane, you can see at the end of the rope, as it were, this sort of lumpy, bumpy appearance of the quarry plexus. This is a very mild Dandy Walker malformation phenotype. Um, the question is, how do these do over time? Probably well, because there's a lot of vermian tissue here, very minimal deficiency of the lower vermis and no hydrocephalus. So traditionally, you know, the Dandy Walker malformation was described as the vermis is absent or it's hypoplastic with counterclockwise rotation. The fourth ventricle is massive and the posterior fossa is enlarged. But, you know, I would submit that the latter two criteria should be uh, stricken from the record uh, because that's really just more of a reflection of the lack of CSF egress from the posterior fossa, right? The degree of CSF um, egress from the fourth ventricle. Um, so it can be variable in Dandy Walker malformation. And, you know, new literature supports that we should change the definition to the following. Vermis is absent or hypoplastic, rotated counterclockwise with an inferior severity gradient. There is a tail sign, an unpaired caudal lobule that we can see here. Uh, the chori plexus telochoridia is displaced infralaterally and a very obtuse vestigial recess of the fourth ventricle. Note in this case, the torcular is not elevated, yet this is still a Dandy Walker malformation. And um, I just want to quickly outline uh, kind of five recent studies that support this notion. So first was the tail sign um, by Bernardo uh, in 2015, Dandy Walker malformation. Is the tail sign the key sign in Dandy Walker malformation? The answer is yes. Postnatally, when you can determine what the tail is comprised of, prenatally, it can be more tricky because if this is the um, lower cerebellar vermis, then this would be a, consistent with a Dandy Walker malformation. However, if this is ectopic chorid plexus, it's more consistent with a Blake's pouch cyst. Um, so that, you know, you, you need other ways to kind of sort that out on fetal imaging. Um, then uh, Tania T. lacroidea complex and chorid plexus location helped distinguish Dandy Walker malformation from, from Blake's pouch cyst. Spoiler alert, um, that was the case. And that this notion was uh, supported um, and by this uh, paper that was subsequently published by Volpe and colleagues um, that lended further credence to the notion that the chorid plexus is displaced down and out in Dandy Walker malformation. Um, and not so much in Blake's pouch cyst. Here you can see on ultrasound sagittal midline, there's no evidence of chorea plexus at the margin of the uh, vermis because it's displaced outward and outside of the quote cyst, which is the enlarged fourth ventricle. Here in Blake's pouch cyst, it's located at the lower surface of the vermis and protrudes into the fourth ventricle. And then there was a paper by Haldeper looking at the shape of the vestigial recess of the fourth ventricle, right? Remember, it should be sharp. In Dandy Walker malformation, it's substantially blunted and obtuse uh, versus inferior vermian or vermian hypoplasia where, where it remains acute. Uh, and it's speculated that maybe whatever process is occurring in Dandy Walker happens before 14 post-conceptual weeks. And finally, this recent publication um, by the International Brainstem and Cerebellum Malformation Consensus Forum of which I am a part, we looked at 446 examinations and we found that tegmental vermian angle and vestigial recessed angles are the most significant quantitative measures to distinguish Dandy Walker from all non-Dandy Walker malformations. Posterior fossa perimeter and torcular location don't matter, right? So again, we should eliminate the location of the torcular and the size of the posterior fossa uh, from our evaluation in terms of is this or is this not a Dandy Walker malformation? Yes, they're often elevated and enlarged in Dandy Walker malformation, but they may not be, and that's nonspecific. So the modern Dandy Walker phenotype is best defined by inferior vermian hypoplasia, enlarged tegmental vermian angle, infralateral displacement of the telochroidia, a petus vestigial recess, and an unpaired caudal lobule. Okay, on to cerebellar hypoplasia. Uh, so inferior cerebellar hypo vermian hypoplasia, um, let's look at that and compare and contrast that to the other um, pathologies. Here we can see um, that this is not consistent with a Dandy Walker malformation because the telochroidia chori plexus extend towards the central undersurface of the vermis. Um, the tegmental vermian angle may be a little bit increased. Um, the lower vermis is underdeveloped 
and the vestigial recess here is sharp. Postnatally here, we can see we're volume averaging in the midline sagittal plane, the hemisphere from the lower surface of the vermis. So here's the inferior surface of the vermis. The vermis is hypoplastic. The vestigial recess is sharp. Here's the telacroidea extending towards the margin of the vermis. So inferior vermian hypoplasia. Um, so you have to be careful what you're calling hypoplasia. You can have a generalized vermian hypoplasia or it can be an inferior vermian predominant. Here, the entire cerebellar vermis is small. Um, and again, remember a mature vermis should extend from the mid tectal plate to the obex, so it's small. Yet the vestigial recess is sharp and the telacroidea is in its normal location. Okay, Joubert syndrome, ciliopathy. I'll start with a postnatal uh, MR appearance here because I, it's a very difficult call prenatally and it helps to kind of like review what it looks like postnatally. Here as a sagittal midline T1 weighted image, here's the lower margin of the vermis. This is cerebellar hemisphere. Um, so the inferior vermis in this patient is hypoplastic. The um, isthmic region, the lower uh, midbrain is a little bit narrowed here. That's a, kind of a tough call. But if you go out to the parasagittal um, images, you can see that there's thickening and horizontal orientation of the superior cerebellar peduncle here. That's very characteristic. Unlike in Dandy Walker malformation, the cerebellar hemispheres tend to be in apposition. Uh, and then if you're lucky, you can see this um, characteristic molar tooth malformation appearance on the midbrain where the superior cerebellar peduncles are thickened and horizontally oriented and the interpeduncular fossa is deepened. But that's variable and sometimes hard to see in Joubert syndrome. Um, I, I would say definitely go to your sag parasagittal um, images and look for that thickened horizontally oriented superior cerebellar peduncles because sometimes you might not see it necessarily in the axial plane as a molar tooth malformation. Here we can see it. Um, vermis is hypoplastic. Also look for um, this disfoliation, disfoliation, which is characteristic along the upper central cerebellum. You can see this very jumbled appearance of the of the fissures and folia here. And if you have DTI, look for lack of decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncles in the midbrain here. We should see this little red dot like we see above. All right, so here's a 19 week uh, that turned out to have Joubert syndrome, uh, gestation on fetal MRI, sagittal and axial planes. The cisterna magna is enlarged, the vermis looks small. Um, but we can see this is not Dandy Walker because the telacroidea extends towards the vermis. And we do get this appearance of a molar tooth malformation in the axial plane. Again, a lot of these are referred early and it's a really tough call. So you have to really look closely for these superior cerebellar peduncular abnormalities. The distro glyconopathies, these, these are um, congenital mus muscular dystrophies that affect the brain. And here we can see a, a patient with Walker-Warburg syndrome. Characteristic in this malformation is this very marked Z-shaped appearance of the brainstem, very malformed and underdeveloped, really reminiscent of actually normal anatomy uh, earlier on. Here's a normal fetus at 11 weeks with this sort of Z-shaped appearance of the brainstem. So in some ways, it's arrested development of the brain. Because the aqueduct is often atretic or at least stenotic, um, you get hydrocephalus. That's another kind of um, very common appearance. Postnatally, uh, we can see um, cobblestone lids encephaly, so smooth outer surface of the brain, very irregular inner surface of the brain due to over-migration of neurons here. Again, hydrocephalus, malformed cerebellum, Z-shaped brainstem. You can also see cystic changes in the cerebellar uh, hemispheres, although that can be a difficult call on fetal MRI. Malformations of the globes also common. And finally, tubulinopathies. Um, here's a 33-week gestation referred for Dandy Walker malformation. Why is this not a Dandy Walker malformation? Uh, the cisterna magna is large. The tegmental vermian angle is elevated, but the vestigial recess is sharp, right? So that kind of goes against Dandy Walker malformation. And then I'm going to look for the location of the telacroidea cori plexus here coming to the undersurface of the vermis. That also excludes Dandy Walker malformation. So this is a vermian, cerebellar vermian hypoplasia, brainstem hypoplasia, 
It's a little bit tilted, although it's not significantly Z-shaped as we saw in the prior scan. I want you to pay attention to uh, the appearance of the ponds where there's this asymmetric hypoplasia involving one side more than the other. That's very typical of a tubulinopathy. Um, and postnatally, we see the same appearance of the brainstem. We see union of the basal ganglia. That's not a feature we can usually pick up on fetal MRI. And again, this is not Dandy Walker, telechroidia going towards its normal location. So for Dandy Walker malformation and related disorders, the first uh, order of business is to evaluate the cerebellum, right? Is the vermis hypoplastic inferiorly? Um, is the vestigial recess blunted? Is there a tail sign? Is the telechroidia displaced inferiorly and laterally? If so, you're dealing with a Dandy Walker malformation. Is the vermis hypoplastic, but the recess is sharp and the telechroidia extends to the vermis? This is a vermian hypoplasia. If it's generalized, it's generalized vermian hypoplasia. If there's inferior predominance, that's inferior vermian hypoplasia. Is the cerebellum normal, but the telechroidia and choroid plexus extends to the lower surface of the vermis, but the tegmental vermian angle is elevated? This is a Blake's pouch cyst. And then if not the diagnosis of exclusion, mega cisterna magna, often we will see duplication or multiplication of the Falk cerebri. So in conclusion, posterior fossa fluid collections are challenging. Dandy Walker, Vermian hypoplasia, and Blake's pouch cysts are usually distinguishable. We should look at the chori plexus and telechroidia. That's important. Also, the vestigial recess of the fourth ventricle shape is important, and the brain deserves special scrutiny. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I appreciate it. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Whitehead. It was an amazing lecture. Yeah, the pictures you showed were really amazing, especially the signs which you showed, the bow tie sign and uh, the speed bump sign, the speed bump appearance. Yeah, so they were really amazing and interesting. I do not see any questions in the question and answer box as of now. We'll wait for a minute. If anybody has any doubts, they can post in the question and answer box. I'm happy to take any questions by email too. So you're, you'll see my email here on the screen. Thank you so much for the email. Yeah, so I get one question. Uh, if you do not see the Taylor well on the FISTA or cyst imaging, would you give a gadolinium as it seems to be easily picked up by the contrast? Um, yes, it is. If, if that's the question, you really need to find out where it is. It is, it could be helpful to give, to give gadolinium because, you know, it is vascularized. You will see post-contrast enhancement of the telechroidium chorea plexus. But I'll say that, you know, if you look closely on, especially on a KISS or Fiesta type sequence, those steady state sequences, we can often pick it up. In a dandy walker, it can be displaced so much anteriorly and inferiorly that if you're not looking in the right spot, you'll miss it. Um, but usually in those cases where it's really displaced, it's not a diagnostic dilemma. You know, you, you can see, oh, there's a deficiency at the lower vermis and there's, you know, the tegment of vermian angle is very increased. And so, you know, we know, okay, there's, this is probably dandy walker malformation. Um, so, but yes, the answer, I guess, technically is yes, um, if you really need to know, but if you look closely, I think at, at those steady states, um, you can pick it up even without, um, you know, and it, it, it comes with training a little bit, you know, you got to sort of pay attention to it. It wasn't, you know, a structure that I was necessarily looking for, even in the past couple of years, you know, so um, over time, if you pay attention, then you'll get better at, at finding it. And I think it's important, uh, especially on fetal MRI, when we're you know, our decision here, you know, it makes a huge impact to, you know, management. Thank you for answering the question. I'm getting appreciation messages on the chat box and the Q&A box. We really like the lecture. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I do not see any more questions here. I thank you for the great lecture which you gave today i i think it was really enlightening especially the images which you used and yeah uh, it was really interesting because you explained everything with the help of the signs and the appearances which was which was really new and i don't think that 
if we google google these appearances i mean they are going to be visible to us i, I mean yeah it comes out of the experience so i thank you so much thank you so much for the lecture my pleasure thank you so much for having me and uh, everybody stay well and uh, have a great weekend